We historically in head and neck cancer have been pushing toxicity by pushing chemotherapy and radiation. And we patted ourselves on the back for curing patients at the expense of lifelong toxicities. Stroke, swallowing dysfunction, loss of taste, dry mouth, dental problems, chronic fatigue, hypothyroidism. Uh, we identified in a predecessor study within ECOG 2399 a group of patients who had HPV-related squamous cell carcinomas of the oral pharynx. And we found markedly better progression-free survival and progression with standard induction chemotherapy and chemoradiation. So we found that if they had, uh, these patients were generally younger, Many of them had never smoked and were in excellent health, and they carried these long-term toxicities for 30 or 40 years. We wanted to see if we could use chemotherapy up front to determine if they had responsive tumors, and if they had a complete response to the induction, they went on to 23% lower dose of radiation. It doesn't improve cure rate. It doesn't necessarily improve targeting, but you have the ability to spare, in this case, the parotid glands, to minimize xerostomia, and you have the ability to spare the larynx and the thyroid gland, which are long-term toxicities of standard, old-style treatment. We took patients that had HPV-related cancers, that had resectable tumors, and good functional status. These were generally younger patients, and about half of them had never smoked. And we needed 80 patients eligible to determine whether we could get an 85% two-year progression-free survival, which was comparable to our prior study using full doses. If they had a complete response to three drugs, which was cisplatin, paclitaxel, and cetuximab for three cycles, they went on to receive lower dose radiation of 54 gray using IMRT to, to minimize long-term xerostomia with weekly cetuximab. Our impression was that if we could get a complete response rate in about 70% up front, that we would have 62 eligible patients to go on to look at not only could we obtain the same cure rate, but could we lower the toxicities. We found that in fact, yes, we met our endpoint where all patients that received low doses of radiation had an 80% two-year progression-free survival and with a 90% confidence interval met our goal of 85%. We also found that the treatment was extremely well tolerated, that 96% of patients received all three cycles of induction chemotherapy, and essentially all patients received full doses of radiation to 54 gray. We also found that the two-year survival of these patients was outstanding, about 95 percent, and that there were, were, were essentially no long-term toxicities. There was one patient who had a grade 3 hypomagnesemia episode three year, well, 30 months after treatment. So nobody was peg tube dependent and nobody had any other grade 3 toxicities uh, far out from treatment. I think it's significant. So we, we've related dose to uh, loss of thyroid function, we've related dose to long-term swallowing complications, and by going 20 to 25 percent less dose, we can reduce dose to a point where we don't reach those thresholds for these long-term toxicities. It'll take another uh, follow-up study, uh, a, a randomized study, to really prove that this is safe for all patients. But what we did find is subgroups of patients in the 62 that were optimal for another long-term follow-up study. These were patients that had minimum smoking history of less than 10 pack years and that did not have bulky T4 tumors and did not have contralateral lymph node involvement. In other words, they did have no uh, N2C disease. If you took all of these patients that had these best favorable prognostic characteristics, they had a 96% progression-free survival and a 96% overall survival. Well, certainly you can see the characteristics of these patients up front. Two-thirds of our patients now with oropharyngeal cancers meet these criteria. The question is, is it safe long-term? Historically, we've seen these HPV-related cancer patients fail three, four, five years out, like we have in the nasopharyngeal Epstein-Barr virus-related group. So we need longer-term follow-up, and we also need to determine whether this is safe for all patients in terms of that we're not jeopardizing patient survival to lower long-term toxicities. And I don't recommend doing this off of a study yet, but it's proof of principle that we can use chemo selection, perhaps, to find the best qualified patients to try to limit, limit toxicity. 
I think there are two groups of patients now that we see with head and neck cancer in our clinic. The smoking related kind that historically we need to maximize treatment even if it means toxicity in an attempt to improve cure rate. The other group of patients is the HPV related cancers and this is the ones that we're studying now and we have to separate those two groups now in terms of how we deal with toxicities that we're putting on patients in an attempt to cure them. These patients do extremely well, perhaps even with minimal chemotherapy or minimal radiation, but we need to test what's the best combination so we don't jeopardize their chance for cure as well. That's going to be tested. Uh, our proposal now uh, is forthcoming. We haven't had it accepted yet, but uh, our proposal is to maybe even to push this even to a lower, lower dose intensity to see if we can continue getting you know, 90 plus percent cure rates and minimize toxicities long term. I think um, this is something that looks promising. I wouldn't attempt to do it in your clinic yet, please, until we have more follow-up and more studies.